Well, today's a very special day because it's kind of the highlight of the Christian calendar, really, because we're celebrating the re resurrection of Jesus Christ literally from the dead. We've been preaching this message for almost 2,000 years. Many thousands of lives, millions of lives have been changed because of this message. And so it's a joy and a privilege to be able to share with you today out of God's Word. Uh, so if you would, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 11. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we do have some on the back table, or you can pull out an app on your phone. Um, you know, if we see you surfing Facebook or something, you know, I'm just kidding, but... Um, <laughs> John chapter 11, and our, our, the we want to draw your attention to this morning is verses 25 and 26, where Jesus said unto her, and this is to Martha, and we're going to read the story here in a moment, but he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this morning. We're here before you with open Bibles. Lord, I pray that we would have open hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. We're expectant. We're listening for you, Lord. We want to know you. Amen. We want to grow and uh, know you in a personal way. And so we ask you to speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Is there life after death? That's one of those questions that are always asked. That's one of the basic questions that everybody faces, right? Especially if you go to a funeral or uh, somebody you love passes away. That is the question that we all come to a point. You might even go to a party. You're full of a crowd of people. You come home, you put your head on the pillow that night, and these are the kind of things that we think about. Is there life after death? Now, this is one of those basic questions that we've been asking from the beginning of time. You know, early on in the history of man, there, some of the earliest literature that we have in the book of Job, there was a man named Job who lost his 10 children in a tragic accident. And as he writes, one of the things that he writes, he asks this question. He said, if a man die, shall he live again? Or more literally, if a man die, does he go on living? So that's one of the earliest documents that we have in history. And already we have the question, what happens after we die? Is there life after death? You know, you might be one of those people like me that you... You know, I came to a point when I was 18 years old. It was after I graduated from here, and I was partying with my friends. And I remember we were up in Valley Center, out um, actually one of our brothers here, one of their properties, it turns out. But in Valley Center, we were on the rock out there. And I remember looking up at the sky and thinking, is this all there is? We're just going to get together Friday nights and party, and that's it? There's got to be more to life than this. And I think every person comes to that question, what's going on? What, what is all this about? What is the purpose of life? And like Job said, if a man dies, does he go on living? The thing for Job was that for him, there was only the question. But there wasn't an answer at that time yet. Um, you know, I think for him asking that question, does a man keep on living? I think that was his way of saying, you know, if I know that this isn't the end, I know my kids died, but if I know this isn't the end, then I have some hope. Then I, I can at least, you know, deal with these feelings of sorrow and grief that I have. But again, for him, there was only the question, no answer. Later on in history, you go through the age of philosophy and the philosophers seeking to answer these questions and the reasons for life, the possibility of life after death. But like Job, there was just the questions, really no answers. Then you have, in the Old Testament, some of the prophets of the Jewish nation were given some references to the afterlife. Uh, Daniel 12.2, where he says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
Psalm 16, verse 10, which we uh, quoted on Friday night, on Good Friday with the cross. But he says, For thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And of course, that was a psalm speaking of the resurrection of Christ. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-six, And they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. Psalm 23, one of those famous psalms that you hear at a lot of funerals. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So there's a reference to eternity. Psalm 49, 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. Ooh, the rain's really coming down. I love that. Bring the Holy Spirit, Lord, upon us, you know. So you had some prophecies given by these prophets of Israel. But you have that time of the age of philosophy that was dying off. And people still had this question. What's going to happen after we die? But then you come to this little town of Bethany, 32 AD, in our text in John chapter 11. It's in this little village called Bethany there on the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. There were these two sisters that were grieving because their brother Lazarus had died. Let's go back to verse 1 and kind of give us the story real quick. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent to him, to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. They realized Jesus loved this guy, Lazarus. His, this man was like a brother to him. He loved him dearly. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. But look what he does in verse 6. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He's in the area of Jericho at this time. You notice he doesn't hurry up and head to Bethany because his friend is sick. He waits two days. Then, after that, he said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and you're going to go there again? You know, like, they've been trying to kill you. You sure you want to go back to the area of Jerusalem and Judea? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, he's going to do well. Like, if he's getting some rest, isn't that good? <laughs> then said Jesus to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes I was not there 
to the intent you may believe, nevertheless let us go to him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. It's kind of like Eeyore, you know, let us go too, we'll die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. So Jesus waits two days. Lazarus has now been dead four days. He wasn't in a hurry to get there, was he? And he said to his disciples, you know, he's sleeping. They said, oh, well, that's good. He probably gets some rest. He goes, no, actually, he's dead. (laughs) Because in the Bible, death for a believer, it's just like going to sleep. You know, a lot of people fear death, and I think all of us, apart from Christ, we do. We fear death. It's like going to sleep, though, for a believer. If you believe in Jesus, you don't have to be afraid. It's like closing your eyes to this world and awakening to the next world. So Jesus here relates death to sleeping, but he says he's been dead for four days already. Verse 18, now Bethany was near to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs, so that's, you know, a couple of miles off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. That's what you do at a funeral. You comfort each other. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. She didn't come. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, My brother had not died. Can't you just kind of hear the anguish in her heart? That's the thing about reading a text. You know, somebody texts you. You you don't know the tone of what they're saying. But I picture her. She's grieving her brother. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And he waited, didn't he? He didn't just show up right away. No doubt she's seen, she's heard about the many miracles of the people that he's healed. And so if if Jesus could get here and he's sick, he's going to heal him and he'll be fine. But he didn't. He waited till he actually died. And then shows up four days later. Really six days in total if you look at the text. She said, but I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Some think that maybe she's asking, Lord, I think you can even bring him back. But I don't know if she really believes that because if that's the case. Because Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise, you know, in the future, in the resurrection at the last day. In other words, I'm a good Jewish girl. I know my theology. I know that our religion teaches that at the last day, everyone's going to be resurrected from the dead. Jesus said unto her, and this brings us to our text, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she, sent, uh, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The master's come and calls for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus was not come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out and followed her, saying, She goes to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So she says the same thing as her sister. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, the Jews also weeping with, uh, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And Jesus said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Then you have the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Now, he knows what he's going to do. He's going to bring Lazarus back to life. They don't know that yet. But why is he weeping? I think because he sees the heartache of sin. 
how sin brings death. And that wasn't how God originally intended the world to be. He intended the world to be perfect. But Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Remember, they ate of the fruit that God told them not to eat. And because of that, there's been death ever since. Everybody who's ever uh, been born has died. Except for Elijah and Enoch. There's two exceptions in the Old Testament. But Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, look how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Right? That's what they're all thinking. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, come, came to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. you got to love the King James. You know, he's smelling by this time, for he has been dead four days. You know, that's really interesting, and I think it's an important detail in the text, because in Jewish thought, a person is in the grave three days, but it's when you get to the fourth day that to them their spirit then leaves their body. I'm not saying that's what the Bible says, but that's what they thought. So it's set up where they know Lazarus is dead. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Said I not unto thee that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that, you, uh, that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. So you notice he's praying, and he's praying out loud so they all hear him, not just so God hears him. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes. You know, I love it how some of the Bible commentators say, good thing he said Lazarus come forth, otherwise all the graves would have opened and everybody would have come out. (laughs) But Lazarus come forth, and he comes out, and he's bound with his grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. You know, get me out of this, you know, kind of a thing. (laughs) Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things that Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. So, you know, there's a division here. Here Jesus raises somebody from the dead, their brother. But isn't that an interesting thing that he says back in verses 25 and 26? This is our text. That is there life after death? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. In our text, you see Jesus give a straightforward, clear answer to the question, is there life after death? Because what does he say? He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Is there life after death? Jesus claimed that there was. And he even said, whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Wait a minute. Jesus is claiming that if you live in this life and you believe in him, you're never going to die? Yep, that's exactly what he's saying. Now, there's two different biblical definitions for death. And I think it's important that we realize that. There's the first definition, which is physical death, right? That's when your consciousness or your spirit leaves your body. You know, the real you is not this body. The real you is a spirit, and you live inside a body, and you have a consciousness, a mind, right? Well, the separation of your spirit from the body, that's death. That's usually, you know, when you see the flat line, and they say that they've lost their brain dead at that point, okay, you know, their consciousness is gone. They're physically dead, But there's a second biblical definition of death, and that is separation of man from God, spiritual death, spiritual separation. 
The Bible says that if you live without a consciousness of God, you're dead. 1 Timothy 5.6, it mentions that there are those who live for pleasure, that they're dead while they're yet living. That's the world in which we live. Everybody's living physically, but most people are dead. And you, you just see it on their faces so many times. Ephesians 2, verse 1, Paul the Apostle told the church in Ephesus, He made you alive that were once dead in trespasses and sins. You know, ever since the Garden of Eden, every person that's been born from Adam and Eve, all of us, we've been born separated from God because we're born sinners. But look at what Jesus says here. If you live and believe in me, he says, you will never die. He's talking about that second definition. You'll never be separated from God if you believe in him. But this is a radical claim, isn't it? I mean, look at the very first part of verse 25. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, Lord, I know my brother's going to rise again on the last day, you know, on, on that great day, the resurrection. And he says, no, I am the resurrection. See, the resurrection is not just an event. It's a person. Jesus is making a radical claim here. You can't be neutral concerning this claim, right? Either he is who he says he is, or he's crazy and a lunatic, or he's a liar. Those are really your only options. He's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he really is the Lord. He is who he claimed to be. But can you imagine anybody else in history making this claim? I am the resurrection and the life. Can you imagine one of our politicians saying this? Can you imagine any of the great leaders, you know, uh, military leaders? I mean, can you imagine George Washington saying this? I am the resurrection and the life. If you live and believe in me, you'll never die. You think that guy's crazy. Pick any famous person. Anybody else says this, you think they're nuts. But Jesus of Nazareth says this, and you have to say, well, is he telling the truth or not? Because this guy's different. This is a guy who claimed to be God in the flesh. This is one that the apostles preached, that he was God in the flesh and that he died for our sins. And that he was the one that the Old Testament had predicted. But look at the last question that Jesus asked in verse 26. He says, do you believe this? He's asking Martha, do you believe this? Today there are many ideas about God and what people need. There's different religions. There's different ideas. You know, and a lot of times we're told really by uh, the world and the media that you know, the modern scientific man it's too sophisticated to believe the Bible literally. Right? It's better to understand it allegorically or morally. It's got a lot of nice stories. And it's probably a good way to live. You know, really, you can't understand God. God can't be confined to human language. You can't really know him. You can't know if he's personal or not. Really, our society tells us there's no moral absolutes. Right? which I find really funny. That's a contradiction to say absolutely there are no absolutes. What? That's a contradiction in terms. The world will say people just need to feel loved and accepted, and if religion helps people, cool, just don't push it on me. And people today, they'll say that there's no use in teaching these old truths because people aren't interested in these things anymore. We have a new mentality now. Since we're in a new age, people are are too sophisticated for these things. So they say you can't really believe in a literal bodily resurrection of Jesus because, you know, we're too sophisticated for that in our scientific age. People don't come back from the dead. That's what they say. Miracles don't happen, they say. But the reality is God has revealed himself to man, and that's one of the reasons he gave us the Bible. Because so many people have different ideas about God. I mean, you, you look at a, a flower and you think, what a beautiful flower. You see the bee buzz in and you see it 
pollinate the flower. And you think, man, that is amazing. God must be so creative and, you know, wise. And then the thing stings you. And you think, wow, God must be evil, you know. And we have all these different ideas. So what God did in history, he chose a man named Abraham. And through this man, he established a nation, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And through this nation, God gave direct revelation to these people. Some, there were certain men in this nation that were prophets. They spoke for God. And they actually made predictions that literally came true. It's not like when you go to the store and you look on the rack and there's, you know, Confucius said, da 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 da, da. There might be an earthquake in May of, you know, 20 whatever. And uh, usually it never happens. But they were right nine out of ten times, you know, so it's got to be true. The Bible is 100% true. Actually, Isaiah, God told through the prophet Isaiah, he said, you know, go ask your other gods to help you. They're not going to help you. He goes, I've told you things before they come to pass. That's how you know I'm like no other God. Jesus even told his disciples, I've told you th these things before they come to pass so that when they do come to pass, you'll believe. One of the ways that I believe, one of the reasons I believe the Bible today is because they're still a Jewish people. Amen. You know, Jesus said, and we talked about this Wednesday night, Jesus predicted that the temple that stood there in Jerusalem, there, there wouldn't be one stone left upon another, that the whole thing would be destroyed. And it literally happened almost 40 years later, 70 AD, it was completely destroyed. Nobody thought that could ever happen. But even hundreds of years before Christ, the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Isaiah, many of the prophets said that Israel, the Jews, would be cast out of their land, spread all over the world, but then they would come back into their land. May 14, 1948 was the rebirth of the nation of Israel. No people have ever been conquered by other people and kept their national identity, let alone for 2,000 years almost, and to come back to their homeland. There's a Jewish state in Israel today, God fulfilling his promises, prophecy being fulfilled. That's why I believe the Bible. Well, there were many predictions about Jesus' coming that he fulfilled. Uh, Friday night, we talked about some of them and the cross. But God gave a revelation to humanity through the prophets, through his word. And in that revelation... Even in the Old Testament, there was a revelation concerning humanity. You know, it was to the Jewish people that God revealed the fall of man. Why are we living in a world the way that it is? Why is there death? Because of sin. Sin entered the world. We're in a fallen world now. And the Old Testament reveals God's holiness. It reveals his threats of judgment and death because of sin. However... God also revealed that although man rebelled against his goodness and against his love, he had a plan of redemption to save and to rescue man and to save him from eternal torment. And through that, he promised a Savior, the Messiah, which turned out to be Jesus of Nazareth. So then, as the Old Testament had predicted, Jesus of Nazareth shows up on the scene in history. He claims to be the Messiah. He claims to be the Savior of the world. And as you're reading this text, you know that Jesus is a historical person. How do we know that? Well, the Bible, we have accurate records of the Bible, but also even outside the Bible, there's historians who mention, like Josephus and others, that there was a historical man, Jesus of Nazareth. Totally changed the course of history. What's the date today? March 31st, 2024. 2024 what? Year of our Lord, since Jesus was here. He changed the course of history. And that's the thing I want to emphasize this morning, is that Christianity, what separates it really from other religions is that it's based in history, not just philosophy. Because if the resurrection literally happened in history, that kind of takes it out of the realm of philosophy. It doesn't really matter what we think or what we, you know, come up with. Did it happen? 
And if it happened, then that changes everything. So his life was proved to be of God. He did many miracles. And we're reading about one here, how he raised Lazarus from the dead. These are people that were eyewitnesses of his power and his miracles. But the thing that really fascinates me about Jesus of Nazareth is that he predicted his own death, that he would die on the cross at the hands of the Romans, but that three days later he would come back to life. He predicted his resurrection. So again, either he's a false lunatic, a liar, or he really is who he says he is, and he did it, right? Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and literally rose from the dead just as he predicted. So that brings the question to me, is it possible that people today will believe in a literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus? Right, because there are those who say, well, you can't take it literally. Of course he couldn't have risen from the body. You know, these were primitive people. They believed in, you know, miraculous nonsense. But I'll tell you, if that's your position, you are totally inconsistent in your position. Because if you believe that there was a Jesus, where did you get that information from? From the apostles, which are written and recorded in the New Testament. And we have thousands and thousands of manuscripts of it, way more manuscripts than of Homer's Iliad or some of the ancient, you know, uh, Socrates or any of these guys. We have way more manuscripts for the apostles and for the Bible. Because you, you might say, well, I believe in the teaching of Jesus, his ethical stance on the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, of course, I don't believe in miracles or the virgin birth or that he literally rose. But how do you know anything? Because of the preaching of the apostles. So these are the men who record for us that Jesus, they saw after the third day, risen from the dead. So either you take everything they said or you take none of it. You can't be in the middle. You can't, well, I believe some of it. Well, how do you pick and choose? Either they were liars or they really saw what they saw. And the thing about these guys, we even have it recorded in history, but many of them even in the scriptures, that they died gruesome, horrible deaths saying they saw him alive. Would anybody die for a lie? If they knew it wasn't true, nobody dies for a lie they know isn't true. They might die for something they believe is true, but not for something. And isn't it interesting that not one person after that third day could ever say they saw the dead body of Jesus? Not once in history is it recorded. But there's thousands of people that said, I saw him alive. There's eyewitness testimony. So again, either you accept all of their testimony or you accept none of their testimony. The apostles, these men chosen by Jesus, they preached that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. And that's a powerful testimony, especially when they had the sword at their throat. They had the nails going to be driven into their hands. And not one of them relented and said, it's not true, it's not true. All of them said, I saw him the third day and I can't say anything else. Changed my life. And yet these are the same guys who the night Jesus was arrested all ran away. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6 even tells us, Paul the Apostle, who saw the risen Lord, he said that Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time. And when he wrote it, he said, and most of them are still alive today. You could go check out the testimony of these people. Do you imagine how many thousands of hours of testimony you would have in a court if these guys said that they saw Jesus alive? I mean, you'd have hundreds and hundreds of hours of testimony, personal testimony. Some people say, well, it was only the followers of Jesus who said they saw him alive after his resurrection. That's not true. James, who was Jesus' half-brother, didn't believe until after the resurrection. And then Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee, who was actually persecuting Christians, having them arrested and killed. You can read about this in Acts 8 and 9. 
He saw and met the risen Christ, totally changed his life, and then he preached Christ and ended up dying for it. So not just the followers of Jesus, the enemies of Jesus. And you know what we call that in the court of law? That's called positive evidence from a hostile source. That means the enemies agreed with what the testimony was, and so that establishes it as a fact. So you have the eyewitness testimony. But the greatest testimony of the resurrection of Christ is the empty tomb right outside Jerusalem. After the third day, anybody could have gone down to the tomb and looked for themselves as the body still there. Nobody could produce a body. Remember what happened with the Roman soldiers, how they were there the morning of the resurrection. I mean, these are the, the Jason Bournes of the day, the you know, Navy SEALs of the day. These were the train-killing machines, right? They, they were told, guard it with the Roman seal. If anybody comes and tries to take the body, execute them. And the thing is that they didn't fulfill their duty as Roman soldiers, they would be crucified. So you're going to do your job, right? So there's theories that, you know, well, the apostles stole the body. Really? Fishermen and tax collectors coming, you know, can you imagine Peter? Let's get our fishing poles and we could take them, you know. I don't buy that. These are train killing machines. They're not going to allow them to steal the body. Well, you know that the Jews didn't take it and move it anywhere because here comes the apostles saying, Jesus is risen from the dead. We've seen him. And they could have said, no, here's the body here. And they produced the body. They couldn't do that. The Romans could have said, you know what? This whole thing's getting out of control. Show them the body and it will stop Christianity in its tracks. They couldn't do it. There's still the empty tomb. And again, the Jews couldn't explain it. The Romans couldn't explain it. Nobody knew, why is it empty? There's only one explanation. is that Jesus walked out of that grave. Amen. Nobody could produce a body because it wasn't there. It was gone. So, back to our text. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. But then he asked this question, do you believe this? When Jesus asked Martha this question, he immediately divides people into two categories. Those who believe and those who don't believe. Those who will see life and those who won't see life. Which group are you in this morning? Jesus said, and we sang about it earlier, I love scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, most people know that scripture. Do you know the ones after that? It says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. God does not want to condemn anybody. It says, but that the world might be saved through him. That's why Jesus came. He came to save us, to rescue us. It says, he that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.36, John the Apostle writes, He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the question this morning is, do you believe in Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? You know, Paul Saul of Tarsus, the one who got converted and that was killing Christians, who ended up becoming the Apostle Paul, he wrote this to the Romans. He says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, 
and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here's the promise. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you done that yet? Have you given your life to Jesus, the risen Lord? The fact that he rose from the dead proves what he said was true. And he promised that if you believe in him, you'll never die. You Physically, you'll die. But you don't have to experience death. See, the second death in the Bible is Revelation chapter 20, where people will be eternally separated from God. But that's not God's heart. God sent his son into the world to save everybody. But like Jesus said, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's another radical claim, isn't it? So either he is who he says he is and that he is the only way to the Father, or he's not. But the fact that he rose from the dead proves that he is the only way. And some people will say, well, that's too narrow. That's, he's the only way. He claimed to be the only way. But it's narrow, but yet it's broad for everybody. Jesus Christ's death on the cross paid for everybody's sins for all time. That is the power of the blood of Jesus. God laid on him the iniquities of us all, our sin. So we're going to give an invitation in a few moments, but first I want to share with you the good news. Do you know that the word gospel means good news? This is good news on Easter Sunday. We preach this every week, but especially today. There's two things I want to share with you. Number one, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He died for our sins. And then he was buried. You know, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What does it mean to sin? That's actually an old English word, uh, to miss the mark. Uh, in, back in Britain in the old days, you know, Roman times, they had the bow and the arrow, and you'd make the, the target. And if you hit the center, you're good. But if you miss the mark... Your arrow goes off, you're a sinner. That's the idea of this word. God's mark is perfection. Don't ever sin. You're completely holy, completely righteous. You've never done anything wrong. That, we've all missed the mark. But yet Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty because the Bible also says, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. You know what wages are, right? You go to work, you earn your wages. This is what we earned. We earned for ourselves death because of sin. But Romans 6.23 also says, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can't get out of death yourself. We can't cause ourselves to be perfect before God. We've already sinned. But yet, he offers this free gift. You can't earn it. That's why it's a gift. You can only receive it. Eternal life is a gift that God freely gives to you, but yet it costs him the life of his own son. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The first thing is that Jesus died for your sins and was buried. But like we've been talking about, on the third day, Jesus walked out of that grave alive in that same body. And he's offering you and I this morning eternal life. He's not offering religion. You know, Nicodemus in John chapter 3 came to him. He was the most religious Jew at that time. He was a teacher, the teacher in Israel. And he came to Jesus at night and he said, I know that you've got to be from God because look at all the miracles and the things you're doing. But Jesus straight up told him right after that, except a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, well, how can I be born? I'm old. Uh, do I go back into my mom's womb? And be? He goes, no. That which is born of the flesh, physical is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit, is spirit. You have to be born spiritually. We're all dead in sins. Even Nicodemus, the most religious guy, was dead. 
He needed to be brought back to life spiritually. That's what Jesus does, and he offers that. Um, So what do you need to do? How do you receive eternal life? And it's real simple. Number one, admit that you're a sinner. It's not easy to do. It's hard sometimes for us to humble ourselves and say, you know what? I, I am not perfect. I need a Savior. But the greatest need that we have is that our sins are forgiven. It's like this. You're going to stand before God and say, it's like a courtroom. And you're going to give an account for your life. We expect a good judge to give justice, right? You know, somebody rapes somebody or they murder somebody. You expect the judge, if he's a good judge, he's going to give justice. He's going to give the right punishment for the crime. Well, we've all offended a holy, eternal God, and so the penalty is eternal death. But it's as if Jesus then came in and paid our fine so that you don't have to do the time. Right? Jesus paid our debt that we owed so that we don't have to pay it. And all he asks us to do is admit that we're sinners. Then he says, repent. To repent means to change your mind and turn around. You've been going after your own life. You've been going after the world. The things. Now turn to God. Turn your life to Him. It's like doing this big U-turn to the Lord. And then third, just believe in Christ and what He's already done for you and receive Him into your life. The Bible says, As many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. Or literally, born ones of God. You become born again when you receive Christ, even to them that believe on his name. See, faith in Christ, it's like putting on a parachute. If you're going to jump out of a plane, we're all going to jump into eternity. But you don't want to go without your parachute. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Faith in him. And the thing about Jesus and these claims that we're talking, I mean, I am the resurrection and the life. If you live and believe in me, you'll never die. You can't be neutral concerning those kind of things. Jesus himself in his ministry, he said, if you're not for me, you're against me. He even said that if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my father and the angels of heaven. But if you're not ashamed of me before men, I won't be ashamed of you. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive Christ. Maybe you came here this morning. Maybe a friend invited you or a family member invited you. But you know what? You're not here by accident. I believe this is a divine appointment. You didn't know you're having a divine appointment with God. So let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And the musicians are going to come up now. Take these next few moments to ask yourself before the Lord, have you received Christ into your life? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sin? And I want to make clear, we're not asking you to join a church. You can't join our church. We don't have a membership. And actually, to be in the church, according to the Bible, you have to be born into it. And that's by putting your faith in Christ. Have you done that? God's not asking you to be religious. He's inviting you into a relationship. See, Christianity is not living by a set of rules. Christianity simplified is asking Christ himself to come into your life and have a relationship with him. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, is there anybody here who say, I've never received Christ, but I want to be right with him this morning. I want to receive eternal life. I want to know that when I die, I'm going to heaven to be with the Lord. If that's you, just raise your hand. We want to pray for you. Is there anybody here you want to receive Christ? You believe that he died for you and that he rose again from the dead, and you want that eternal life. Anybody here, just raise your hand. Not so much so I can see it, but the Lord can see it. God bless you in the front. Anybody else? He's inviting you. He's calling you. He's been working in your life to this moment because he wants a relationship with you. Is there anybody else you want to receive Christ this morning? 
Is there anybody here who would say, you know, I've been playing games with God. I haven't been walking with him. I've been living for myself. And you're, you're like the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter. You've been running away, but you know it's time to come home. Is that you? If that's you, do you want to rededicate your life to the Lord? Just raise your hand. We want to pray for you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody want to rededicate your life to the Lord today? Praise the Lord. Lord, I pray for those here who are struggling. They want to receive you, Lord, but they're also scared of what does that mean to my life. Lord, I pray that you would show them that it's not that they're giving up something good. They're gaining something great. I'm so thankful for the day, Lord, that I surrendered to you and gave up really hell and condemnation and guilt but was forgiven and experienced that peace. I pray for anybody here, Lord, that needs that. They've never done that. That today would be the day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love for us. If you raise your hand, even if you didn't raise your hand, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. A simple prayer. To receive Christ. To receive eternal life. And this is just between you and Him. And prayer is just a fancy word for talking to God. So just talk to Him as if you're talking to a friend. And say, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you, to forgive me of everything I've done wrong. I believe that you died on the cross in my place, that you died for me. And I ask you to forgive me, Lord. And I do believe that you came out of that grave and that you rose again the third day. And I turn to you now. I turn away from my old life, Lord. I turn to you. And right now, I want to receive that gift of eternal life. Please fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And help me to follow you from this day forward until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you rededicated your life to the Lord or you received the Lord for the first time, I want you to after we're dismissed, we're going to have some elders up here at the front. Come talk to us. We'd love to follow up and, and talk to you about walking with the Lord because this is a whole new journey. And maybe some of you, you didn't raise your hand. Totally fine. Come talk to us anyway because the Lord loves you and he wants a relationship with you. This isn't just some religious ceremony that we're doing. This is a relationship with God. And I know when I first gave my life to the Lord, I was like, you know, I came to a church like this and I thought, wow, these people are worshiping. It's like they know God. And I don't know him like that. You know, Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you and him whom he sent. Right? Knowing God, knowing Jesus, that's eternal life. Let's all stand and let's thank the Lord for that eternal life that he gives and worship the Lord and thank him. And and again, if you did receive the Lord or you rededicated your life, we want to pray with you again and and encourage you. We can give you a Bible if you don't have a Bible. But uh, we just thank the Lord for his resurrection and the, the glorious good news of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing.